Well, and I've learned too is if they think about it as just a number, they're going to get just a number as a tenant. If you think about it as a home for a family, you're going to get a resident that calls it their home. It is a common saying amongst real estate investors that you make money when you buy, not when you sell. While this catchy phrase has value, it fails to convey how easy it is to lose money through poor property management. Whether you self-manage or hire a professional, it is important to understand how to navigate the common pitfalls and challenges with rental properties without losing your shirt or your mind. That's why you have tuned in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. I'm your host, John Stiles, real estate agent and team leader of the VIP Real Estate Group at Bridge Realty. As a current multifamily investor and former property manager myself, I understand the headaches and difficulties of keeping an investment property from becoming a money pit and time sucker. It takes a solid business plan, it takes tested systems, and it takes key team members to actually find success. So let's take a deep dive and maximize your property value. Welcome back everybody to another edition of Maximizing Your Property Value. I'm your host, John Stiles with Bridge Realty, and I'm excited for another great episode. I am joined today by Brenda O'Connell, who is the lead rental representative with Twin Cities Leasing. Brenda, thanks for coming in today. You're very welcome. I'm excited to be here. Great. Brenda, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a part of Twin Cities Leasing? Yeah, Twin Cities Leasing was based off of a few of us that got together that had worked for other property management companies and felt that the customer service level wasn't there that was needed. So we took a step back and we kind of made our company what I call old school. We're 80s company. We are okay with you calling us on the telephone. We're okay with you sending us a text. We're more hands-on where we have a one point of contact, which is me, your rental rep. Okay. And uh, so where did you start off? How long ago did you get into property management? I actually fell into it in college. Um, I went to go look at a rental myself with a couple of girlfriends and we didn't like the place, but the guy was actually the owner that was showing us the property and he kind of got a gist of my personality and called me a few days later and he's like, you ladies going to rent it? I'm like, no, we're not going to rent it. And he's like, do you need a job? I'm like, what? <laughs> And I actually fell into property management that way. I was uh, about six months later, I was in charge of uh, 156 college bedrooms. And then from there, it grew over the next two to three years up to 296 college bedrooms. Wow. Yeah, yeah it was exciting. That's quite a way to start out. Um, so right now with Twin Cities Leasing, what does your company kind of focus on as far as the ideal clientele? Is it you know, small properties, large properties? We're open to anything. Right now, we do a lot of single family or multifamily homes. Um, we were going to, in the next year or so, we want to start getting into apartment buildings. We want to present a one-stop shop. So from an investor who has about eight doors to the what I call the accidental landlord that has only one that kind of fell into the rental world, we can handle all that from start to finish. Okay, wonderful. So let's get started with a few things about property management. You know, as different owners look for the, at their different options within the Twin Cities, there are a lot to choose from. There's a lot to consider. So what would you say kind of sets your company apart from the rest? I think it comes down to our customer service, hands down. Uh, we try to put ourselves into your shoes as the owner or the resident shoes um, just to make the process easier. We, we understand a lot because we're experienced. In our company, a combined experience is almost a 30 years myself, I'm just pushing up on 15 years. So when I look at different things or different situations come up, I look at not only the owner's standpoint, not only our standpoint, but also the resident's standpoint and say, okay, what is the best route from here? We very, we make it very humanized, not just cut and dry. Okay. Very good. So, and you kind of answered this a little bit, but how within the company do you split up roles and how do you keep things organized and efficient? Yep. We have lots and lots of task bars that we have in-house, but we try to do what we do best. So there's a team that does the maintenance and they focus just on maintenance. Me, I focus on the resident placement and then the one-stop shop, like I spoke earlier about the management. So I have already built up a relationship with the owner and I've moved the residents in and built up that relationship. Having me as their one point of contact has actually really helped for not getting surprises later. Like, well, I didn't know who to call. I'm like, don't, 
you just call me, let me know. Um, and then we have an office staff where we have our finance person, we have our behind the scenes, double checking paperwork, all that stuff. Okay. So we're a well-oiled machine. <laughs> nice. Well, um, you know, one of the objections that I've seen to this type of setup, and I, I have experienced it in my own background, I used to be a property manager, but um, is that just how do you keep on top of everything? How do you stay organized with all those different relationships and, and who's responsible for what are, I should say, you know, what, what problem is, is going with which property? I don't know. How do you stay organized with that? We, we basically have learned from making mistakes at the other companies we worked with. We like on my way into the meeting with you, I was on the phone with my staff at the office going, okay, did you know about this? I want to make sure you're aware of it. Uh, a lot of times it's emails so that we can stay on a, a thread and we sh sometimes overshare but we'd rather over communicate than under communicate. Um, the other thing too is, is when situations arise, we're upfront with the owner from the start so that they're not like, oh my gosh, later. We just want to be all around easily access to whatever they need. Yeah. Very good. All right. So the next part of my show is called rentals make me laugh. <laughs> Sounds good. And you know, if you've been in it for this length of time, I think you've got probably a couple of stories, whether it's with interactions with the tenants or the owners or the, you know, contractors, whatever it may be. So can you share anything with us that would just kind of lighten the mood here today? Oh, totally. It's, it's fun. And you're, you're seeing different genres change, different groups of people becoming in the rental world. A lot of people are like, oh, baby boomers are going into old folks home and they're still homeowners. They're actually starting to become renters now because they want to travel. They want to be free from that home ownership. But then we got this lovely millennial group coming up that always keeps me on my toes. Um, for example, when we collect our first month's rent, a lot of times we ask for certified funds and they don't even know what a cashier's check is. But then we turn around and the older generation, we ask them to do an online payment and they're scratching their head. So I get all different crazy stories that happened. I actually had a gentleman yesterday, unfortunately his house got broken into. And what was his first reaction? Call me. I'm like, no, let's hang up and we'll call the police. We never know what's going on. Um, but being in the rental business is so rewarding, um, especially when the big crash was. You know, I was helping people that I had a, this one story sticks out in my mind. A husband and wife, husband was in masonry, wife was in real estate. Both both career fields were very down during that time. They did everything they could to keep their house. Unfortunately, they couldn't. So I helped them and I was allowed to be a part of their journey to find them a rental. And what I know of, they are still in that rental home to this day. Those are the reasons why I do rentals is you never know who you're going to talk to. You never know who's going to be either laughing or crying because of some situation they couldn't handle. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And... You know, the next thing I want to talk about is customer service. And you've already kind of mentioned that as one of the, your differentiating factors in your company. But talk to us more specifically about how does that look with interacting with a tenant? Oh, it's, you have to be, because of the way the world is, you have to be ready at any time. Um, I always joke that I have a property mind mindset. So I never, every time I answer the phone, I never know what the story, the craziness is going to be. I just have to be open-minded and get back to them. Um, one of the things that I pride myself in is getting back to somebody within 48 hours. I look at it as like a tennis match. You put the ball in my court, I'm going to hit it back. Now I'm going to wait for you. I'm not a used car salesman. I'm not going to keep on you and keep on you. I'll remind you, hey, hit the ball back, but I'm not going to keep going. Because I've taken that role, my the feedback I've gotten from people is you're nice to work with because you make it an easy process. So that's the way I look at it. It's just like a game. We hit the ball into each other's court and wait for it to come back. Sure. And I guess, how does that compare with, like, sometimes we might be tempted to approach tenants as a commodity or as a hassle or a problem. You know, how do you combat that mindset because of the difficulties that can sometimes come up with this business? Definitely. Uh, great question. So the way we look at it is we don't find tenants, we find residents. And just that word softens it up. Um, I've been very, very blessed. I don't know how or why, but I have only three evictions on my record in 14 years. What I do is I find out the Are little those things. on your record? Or no, on not on my... <laughs> great question. Not on my, initial, my personality. And all three were crazy situations. Um, it was college housing. 
Kids just picked up and moved out. That's one. Second one, wife lost her um, child support and her um, alimony. What is she going to do? According to the neighbors, she just picked up and leave. She was not proud of what the situation. Third one was even weirder. It was a family up in Big Lake. They were looking for their dream home, couldn't find it, needed to move. They signed a lease on Friday over the weekend. They found their dream home, called me Monday and was like, I need to get out of my lease. I'm like, here's your options. They're like, we're not going to do anything. You can evict us. We found it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so you just never know where each situation is, but that's kind of what I would say. Yeah. Okay. And then what about specifically to the property owners? You know, um, I think that's one of the biggest objections that owners have is like just the customer service isn't there with their property manager. You know, they, they try to let the manager do their job, but it seems like the, they're bo- dropping the ball. I don't know. How do you handle that relationship with the owner to make sure they, they are confident in your service? Oh, a great question again. Uh, basically, like I said, is we put ourselves into their shoes. So I had a situation where I had tenants that moved in. The owner was trying to sell and couldn't sell. Residents moved in a month later. They said their sink was backed up. So we went out to look at it. We ended up finding something that the tenants put in there. Well, we're not going to charge the owner for that maintenance request. We're going to protect them. We're actually going to charge the residents for that. So that's what we mean when we say we put ourselves in their shoes is what would I do if I was in their shoes? The other thing too is we always tell them, let us do what we do best, your property management. If you don't hear from us, that means we're doing a great job. Um, Like I just joked with one of my clients that I've worked with for years and years and years. He's a cute old gentleman that does all his maintenance himself and whatever. And he calls me up. He's like, Brenda, I'm going to have to let you go. And I'm like, what, what did I do? He goes, you just did too good of a job. You found me perfect tenants. They never call. And, and I was like, okay, well, what can I do to keep you under management? So he trusted me enough to find that qualified resident to live in the house. And that's what I always joke with homeowners when I meet, I'm like, after this, my goal is never to talk to you again. That means I did a great job. All right. What ways have you found that you need to balance this customer service with enforcing the rules of the lease? Yeah, great question. So I tell a lot of my homeowners, I want to be their friend to a point, but then when I have to put down my foot, I can. So I want them to communicate when, why rent is late. Most times, especially today is October, what, second, I'm going to get all these text messages. Oh, my rent will be in in a few days. I'm waiting for a paycheck. I want that open communication so that I can turn around and then let the owner know. On the other side, if I have to go, dude, it's the 10th. Where, where's your money? Come on. I can put down my foot and I'm not too mean that I totally close them off and then close the door to when they do maintenance requests and everything else. I try to tell everyone I'm that cushion. I'm not your dad coming down on you. If you break something, I'm that crazy aunt that we see each other at holidays and that's about it. That's the way I look at property management. Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm interrupting the show quick because I wanted to invite you to a special event that I'm hosting at the end of 2019. You know, the end of the year during the holidays is a great time to be getting together with friends and family, making new memories and even new traditions. One new tradition that my family started a few years ago is volunteering at Feed My Starving Children. If you haven't heard of this organization, you should definitely check out their website. It's fmsc.org. Basically, they utilize volunteers to pack nutritious meals, and then they send those meals overseas to different areas of the world that have a significant need for food. These meals have made a huge impact in thousands of people's lives. And I really like volunteering with Feed My Starving Children for two main reasons. Number one, it gives you a tangible way to give back. It's not just giving money, which of course is important, but it allows you to use your time and your energy alongside of other people in a common cause. And number two, it fosters discussion of how we can live our lives serving others and not just be focused on ourselves. And since this is a family-friendly event, it allows us to live out this mindset right along with our children. So would you consider joining me? I've reserved 50 spots, and this is room for you, a friend, a loved one, to join with us and help out the cause. It would be really amazing to see you there. The date, time, and location is in the show notes. There's also a link that allows you to sign up and let us know that you're going to be there. And you can share that link with other people that you think might be interested. So thanks so much for considering it. Now, let's get back to the show. Now I actually have a question from our audience. So I'm just going to pull that up here. Okay. 
Hello, my name is Demetrius from Apple Valley, Minnesota. And my question is, how frequently should I inspect my rental property? So that's kind of from the perspective of managing it themselves, or even if they do have a manager, but um, you know, should the homeowner be inspecting it as well? So what, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. You have to kind of feel out your residence. You don't want to and, and put yourself as either management or owner into their shoes. Do you want somebody knocking on your door every 30 days to look at everything? No, do it every like three weeks, or no, I'm sorry, three months. And then if it looks nice, don't show up again for a year. If it looks like, or you hear concerns from the neighbors or from them themselves, like all these maintenance issues, keep yourself in there more often. You always want to catch something when it's a pinhole, not a basketball size is what I always say. So having that open communication, you don't have to do as many inspections. I would say every six months um, and then use it as a way to do your property upkeep. So change your furnace filters, even though if you ask them to double check that if you have a water softener, check that exterior, make sure the gutters are cleaned out. I usually say spring and fall are your best times. Winter, no one really goes outside. You can't see the grass. Summer, when they're cutting it, you know they're walking it for you. So I would say spring and fall is your best time. Plus, it seems like it's the easiest time to get a hold of people. Okay. And do you have any systems within your company that kind of reminds you to follow up with these properties? So, for example, if, if there's a tenant who's paying on time and they're never calling for maintenance, you know, how do you make sure that you do check in on them and... It doesn't kind of get lost or whatnot. Yep. Yeah, so if they do put in a maintenance request, we always ask, is there anything else you want us to look at while we're there? Opens up that door. If we are in an apartment building and we're at the neighbors, we might knock and just see how everything's going. Um, same with duplexes and triplexes. We walk the community areas too. Usually one will lead to the next, but it's just a matter of keeping in touch with them and always keeping that door open on our side to say, you know what? Let us know right away. It will... And when you let us know right away that you have a maintenance issue, it's less likely to come out of your security deposit at the end. Presenting that up front has actually helped a ton. And the reason why is everybody wants their money at the end and they want that security deposit. So if you set that standard right at the front, it usually doesn't hit you in the backside. Okay. That's really great. Setting those expectations up front um, can really be a game changer. Walk us through that a little bit. How, at what point in the conversation do you set those expectations? You know, when when you're first showing the property or when you're signing the lease or during a walkthrough or all of the above? I am very much as a step person. I don't want to overwhelm somebody at the beginning of the showing if they're not even interested in the property. They came and they don't get those warm fuzzies. If they do get the warm fuzzies, we'll go in detail. I kind of let them lead. Um, same with the lease. We set expectations in writing. So for example, yes, we expect you to change the batteries in your smoke alarms. Yes, we expect you to change the light bulbs. That's not a maintenance request. And then on move-in day, it's actually a full process that we do um, to protect everybody all around. So we don't only, we do a two-step process. We do a paper trail. So if there's a hole in the wall, we write hole in the wall. If the, and then we follow it up with a video. We also put our hand like next to the hole to represent how big the hole is. Once I'm done with that, I sign, they sign off on it. And then I go through other steps to help them, especially we talked about those millennials earlier. How do I change a furnace filter? How does a fuse box work? What is a salt water? You know, what salt goes in the water softener? Little things that you don't, you would assume they know, but they don't. Um, I always say, and, and this isn't trying to be mean, but pretend you're moving your 18-year-old niece or nephew into the house and this is their right. first place. That's what you want to set that bar for. And then hopefully it prevents stuff later. Okay. That's great. So for the larger properties that are in really investment properties, mm -hmm. they're valued based on the net operating income. And so, you know, for a really intentional investor who's trying to maximize their property value, what, what um, ways have you found to really increase the income side of that equation? Yeah, well, one is, would you live in this property is one of my main questions I ask investors. I had a gentleman early on in my career that owned an apartment building and it was an eight, eight two bedroom building. And he used to paint all his rooms white. And I just would tr tremble because I'm like, would you live in a white building? And all of a sudden when I said that, he goes, oh, that makes sense. I wouldn't want to live here just by painting a neutral color. You're more likely to cover up fingerprints first off. But people feel that warm fuzzies faster than a white building. Um, keeping up with your appliances and making sure that they work is huge. 
And then just getting in an overall good feeling when you walk into a property. Those are some very basic things. Exterior, making sure it looks nice. That's huge, but you can't always control that if the resident that is currently living there is moving out and they just can't keep up with it. Um, and then other ways that we've talked about, like helping an investor get the most bang for their buck. A lot of properties, for example, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, if it's a multifamily home, the water, sewer, and garbage has to stay in the owner's name. A lot of these buildings only have one meter because they're so old. Well, what can we do so that the homeowner doesn't have to pay that? Let's budget it. So we'll market it for the market value and then we'll sell it to the resident going, hey, great news. You're only going to have to pay one bill. You won't have to pay the water sewer randomly, stuff like this. So we're going to up it a hundred bucks. We're going to wrap that in. Now you're actually getting a hundred dollars more than you actually marketed it for. So those are some creative ways we have gotten to help investors make the most money each month. Yeah, that's huge. I like what you said about having the owner picture themselves in the property and how would they feel living there. I think that can make a huge difference and really help the owner make their decisions when they're choosing paint colors or, or any other thing with the property. Well, and I've learned too is if they think about it as just a number, they're going to get just a number as a tenant. If you think about it as a home for a family, you're going to get a resident that calls it their home. You're going to walk in and it's going to smell like apple pie. They're going to have their kids' toys. You're going to see the little marks on the wall where they watch their kids grow up. That's the kind of resident you want to find. My goal is to find somebody that's there for five years, not five months. Yeah, well, that's huge too. So on the other side of that equation is the expenses. And that can be one area you know, that owners have objections to even hire property managers because they feel like their expenses are just going to fly out of control. Um, so what ways have you found to keep those under, keep those expenses, you know, where they need to be? Right. So again, like I said earlier, is keeping the residents responsible for errors that they make and the maintenance issues that they handle. Um, as a homeowner, if they fall on in the living room and they knock a hole in the wall, that's something that they are, should be responsible for. Same as the rubber ducky going down the toilet. That's not something the owner came over and said, Whoop, and put the rubber ducky. It's Nope, we got to hold them responsible for what they did. Um, also including as much as you can in the rent, but being creative, like I talked about with the water and utility. Same with giving them a discount for doing, doing certain things on the property. Lawn and snow, for example. Hey, if you don't want to do it, that's fine because a lot of people don't have that time because of the way the world is. But giving them a discount on their rent for doing that, and it's kind of a thank you. We don't want to be a, we don't want to get coupon clippers, as I call it, but we want to give a value to that. So that's how I try to do it. And then showing a value on why we charge what we charge. So for example, at Twin Cities Leasing, we charge $99 a month. Well, if you think about it, if you break it down month or daily, it's less than a cup of coffee, less than a gallon of gas. I'm on call 24 seven in my entire crew where we can help you with all your needs. So there's a huge value in that. Yep. And how do you handle maintenance? Do you have um, staff or do you work with subcontractors? We have an in-house maintenance department. Um, we have a general contractor. And then if it's something that he can't handle, we have partnered up with a lot of subcontractors to make sure our general contractor can't be an electrician, a plumber and everything, mowing grass, the whole shebang. But we have made great relationships with the same companies that we go back. And we do follow up with our residents to make sure that they had the same value and the same customer service that we would provide if we were in those people's shoes. So Okay. Yep. Great. And have you found out any really good products to use in your properties that will last longer, you know, through the, because we know that usually rental properties, they wear down faster than if it's your own house. So what products have you found that maybe will last longer? Depending on the house, we're actually trying to get away. One of the biggest things is carpet. We're trying to get away from carpet. It is wear and tear, but if you get really, really nice stuff, you're going to weed through it a lot faster. If it's like when I did college housing, when I used to rent those out, we did indoor outdoor carpet. It lasts those college kids a lot more. But now with all the technology and the flooring, that's an example. Um, same with what kind of paint you use from eggshell to flat, which one lasts better. You know, flat, you can cover up better over time. Eggshell is harder to patch because of the shear on it. You know, certain things like that um, really make a factor, but gets... Like when it comes to appliances, get something that works good, but yet don't get something that looks bad. They go hand in hand. Yep. Very nice. 
So I want to ask you now about how you might get involved with a property owner when they're either looking for a new investment um, to buy or selling the one that they have. Um, does your company also represent in sales or? We have that option. We like to focus right now. We're just still sticking to property management, but we're here to assist them. Um, we want to focus on what we do best, which is property management. If you ask a realtor to rent out your house, it's like asking me to sell your house. We both can do it, but let's get the best person in that foot. So we've partnered up with a lot of companies um, and we want to have somebody that's focused on the area. So if I know a realtor in New Brighton and you're the realtor down in Bloomington, I would put a Bloomington person with a Bloomington person. Um, as for, I have lots of investors that I work with and they always call me. There's one gentleman that calls me all the time. What do you think this will rent for? Give them my feedback, depending on the time of year, what you do with the property, stuff like that. Well, I, I factor all that in so that they can make the most educated guess on if they should put money down on it and where they should go, how long they need to keep it for. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really valuable resource yes. for investors because uh, you're the you know boots on the ground. You know, that we can look at these different online tools, which I think, you know, they've come a long way. They, they're very helpful. But then if you have somebody who's actually in the business as your, uh, you know, your resource, that's that's really helpful. Well, and surprisingly, residents use this tool, too. So, for example, we have the wonderful website Zillow. I had residents that came into a very nice brand new build that's up for rent up in Blaine and they wanted to counter offer what we had it for rent. And I asked them like, where did you come up with this number? And they said, well, Zillow said so. Great. And then I educated them. I took a step back out of my element and I go, okay, here's what you need to know. So you don't not insult, but hurt that homeowner's feelings. Like, oh no, I should be getting this when you're actually saying I'll offer you this. Hmm. So take us through that quickly. What? How did you educate them in, uh, in what the value should be for that for that rental? Yeah, I just told them you can't go off of just one website. I, I mean, I hate talking down about millennials, but it's whatever is right in front of them. I'm like, no, well, check out this website, this website, this website. These are the ones that you can lean on to find the best properties, you know, and what's all included. Like we talked about earlier, like this one was we had it listed for twenty five. They wanted to offer twenty two, and I go, well, wait. Your utilities are included here where at this property, they're not. So you're actually going to end up paying more at the other property. The same value that I give people when they're um, trying to figure out in between a townhome and a single family home, especially the younger generations won't realize the cost is different from a brand new build to an old house in you know Northeast Minneapolis. Your utility bills are going to be very different because the technology was different there. Yep. So that's huge. Yep. Um, so... Next, I want to ask you about how the rental market is doing. I think we've all pretty well aware that um, rents have been increasing quite a bit. Um, there's lots of concerns about affordability, um, but also we're all wondering, you know, how long can this trend continue? So based on your experience, for example, how long is it taking to fill a unit? How many showings does it take? Uh, what's your projection about where we're headed? It's interesting. A lot drives from the owner. So if you have an investor, they're all about the dollar bill. But I like working with the accidental landlord, as I call it, that have maybe one or two properties that fell into it. They see the big picture. They want a family in their house. Investor wants to make the most bang for your buck. If you think about it, is it worth it to raise the rent $100 a month and then re-rent it out when they realize in 12 months they can't afford it. Now you're going to pay to have new tenants in. You have the risk of, sit it, of it sitting empty. Or do you price it aggressively at a good reasonable price that people can afford so that they will stay for the long haul? Um, crazy situation I had one time. I had a homeowner that actually dropped his rent by $25 instead of having his residents move out. He knew they were family. The kids were getting older. There was probably more cost but he really enjoyed them because they took care of the property. He wanted to thank them. And for $50, which comes to what, just over $500, it was worth the value to him over the long period of, he didn't have to repaint. He didn't have to do this. He didn't do, have to do all these things and then take the risk of finding who knows on the next go around. So when you do have a good resident in your home, keep them, make them happy. They'll stay there forever. Um, more and more people are staying longer in properties than they used to even four years ago. Yeah. When it comes to the leasing, are you finding you need to give more concessions or, you know, are you having to 
drop the price or is it still pretty strong demand out there? Uh, depends on the time of year. That plays a big factor. So a lot of my properties at the beginning of August, I was sitting there going, we need to price it aggressively because school starts. If they had that house that would fit that family. Um, I know we can't, you know, legally say I want a family with a husband, wife and kids. But if the house is kind of presented for that, that's what you want to go for. Right now, I'm telling all my owners, drop the price, drop your price, drop your price. And here's the reason why. Who knows when it's going to snow? That first snowfall, you won't be able to get a hold of me by phone because my phone will be blown up. Everybody will be grabbing whatever they want. Now then we're going to head into the holidays. No one moves between Thanksgiving and New Year's. So those are going to be coming right now. So we're sitting at the first week of October. Now we want to get price it for the snow falling and then go from there. Um, and then also what we do is we try to put their leases in the best time of year to rent to get them the most value. So I had a gentleman that bought a brand new investment property and he wanted, it was a September 1st move in. Well, the lady that was moving in asked if she can have it end in the springtime so that when she buys a house, she can only hopefully do a, a smooth process into a new home. And I said, yeah, we can do that. So we signed a 22 month lease, which is not the norm. I try to set it up for both parties to win. So usually it's, it's a pretty easy sale, but Hey, you got kids. Let's wait until school ends. Did you remember Memorial day? Did you remember labor day? 4th of July. We want to get it in between April and August is our end date. Yeah. That makes sense. And then sense. you can get the most bang for your buck too. Cause that's when everyone's moving. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, I appreciate all of that. Um, I'm going to tra transition here a little bit, but before I do that, any kind of final comments about um, what our property owners should be considering as they are looking at their rentals? The biggest thing is, is how much effort do you want to put into it? Uh, it, it? Yeah, an investment property, you want to gain value, grow, and you want to pay down a mortgage so that you can hopefully sell it or give it to your kids or whatever. You usually, as an investor or an accidental landlord, have a full-time job. Hire someone that does it full-time like myself to take that stress off your plate. Um, I have a gentleman right now who's an investor and he's got his first kid on the way. He was smart. He hired us before the kid arrived so that he can enjoy it and not worry about that. That transition from being a owner themselves or if you're working with a current property management and you want to go to a new management like ourselves, there's about a six-month, lots of hiccups along the way. It's not a quick flip a switch and go. It's relearning, re-educating them, and getting them, getting them used to it. Um, it's kind of like a blind date going into marriage is what I call it. It's that first relationship. Hey, this looks great. And now the next 12 months, you're locked in with them. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is hiring a management company is huge. It takes a lot of stress off of you. And trust the people that have been doing it for the long haul. They know how to put out fires very quickly. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a really great uh, information. I appreciate you sharing that. Welcome. Um, before I let you go, I want to give the audience an opportunity to just get to know you a little bit better. So a couple of quick questions about yourself. Uh, why do you get up in the morning? <laughs> Great question. I love the crazy questions I get all day long. Um, from this morning to an investor that is now changing to, I'm thinking about Airbnb and educating them to, oh my gosh, my, you know, my fridge stopped working. It's, it's the unknowns that drive me to go psh and put out that fire right away. I really, really get a high off of that. It's exciting. The biggest thing, too, is when I watch a, a husband or a wife or a single person walk up the driveway and you could just see the stress on their face. And I somehow help them along that journey to get into a property for them not to put a roof over their family's head, but to find a home. That's the number one reason why I do this is that reward. It's it's very small, but it's very giving. So my next question is, what is a person or event in your history that has been pivotal to changing your life to what it is today? It was that rental. When I walked in and fell into property management, hands down, I didn't even know what property management was. I didn't know what a leasing agent was. It's a fluke that I'm doing this for so long. Um, people joke, they're like, oh my gosh, you've been doing it this long. I'm like, yeah. It was somebody giving me that shot to see what I can do with it. Um, when they told me they set goals for me and I kept knocking them out of the park, they just kept buying more properties. They saw something in me and it was fun for me to get that challenge. So I want to, it, it goes back to when I literally fell into property management 
that was my turning point and I haven't I don't know what else I would do <laughs> at this point in my life sweet okay um and then what is the best way that our audience could get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more about Twin Cities leasing or uh, just kind of pick your brain about the about rental properties. Yeah, so the best, honestly, the best route to get a hold of me is email. And the reason why is because I'm on the road all the time. I am in appointments left and right, which is a good thing, but I'm never too busy to answer a question. I'm here for any of your crazy situations. Just give me a call. I'll give you my feedback and go from there. And I will honestly tell you, if I don't know the answer, I'll point you in a direction that somebody does know. I can admit when I don't know something. And I think that makes me stronger. But I also will tell you, Tell me what you learned so I can learn too. Every day you should wake up and you should learn something new and that's what I enjoy. But my email address and the best way to get a hold of me is Brenda, B-R-E-N-D-A, at TwinCitiesLeasing.com. Um, if you feel free to text me or call me, you can always call myself, 320-282-6565. Wonderful, Brenda. Well, I appreciate you sharing that and being uh, kind of an open book. And yeah. I think that's really helpful for the audience. So... Um, before I let you go, I want to give you a, a small gift for coming in. This oh, is the thank you. Maximizing Your Property Value mug. And I want to ask you, what are you going to put in there? What am I going to put in there? I'm going to keep it empty. Okay. And here's the reason why. Because then I'm open to getting all your questions and concerns to fill that. So call me and ask me. Try to stump me. That's what I want to put in there. All right. Wonderful. And I'm just going to talk to our audience briefly here. I appreciate all of you for listening. Um, also want to encourage any of you, if you have questions for my next and future guests, um, I would appreciate you turning those in just like we had one earlier a question from the audience. So that really helps the conversation to be a little bit more dynamic and for you to get involved. So thank you so much for listening. If you got anything from this show, be sure to share it with your network online. So thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a great day, Brenda. Thank you. The opinions shared on this show are for informational purposes only and should not be taken as a solicitation for representation or investment in any specific offering. Please consult with your financial, legal, tax, and real estate advisor before making any investment decisions. John Stiles is a licensed Minnesota real estate agent with Bridge Realty. Thanks for tuning in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. If you're considering scaling up, downsizing or right-sizing your real estate investment portfolio, it's important to know how to determine your property's value in today's market. That's why I've put together a free ebook for you called How to Calculate Your Investment Property's Value. To get your copy, go to www.realestatestyles.com forward slash value. Now, if you found any value in today's show, be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, YouTube channel, and podcast through your favorite podcast player. All the links are in the show notes. And would you do me a big favor? Help me get the word out about this show by sharing with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. And lastly, we appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. I really appreciate you and wish you the best in your real estate investing career. Signing off, I'm John Stiles with Bridge Realty. Make it a great day.